Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I have the pleasure of being joined by Frictional Weekly, as we share some truly macabre stories, which are sure to terrify you. So grab a flashlight, and get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. Now hiring, last three employees killed themselves by Tobias Wade. Twelve weeks looking for a job, and things were getting desperate. I'm talking water and electricity off, desperate, with the landlord playing my door like a drum. I called my way through entire directories of offerings often not sure what I was interviewing for, until the morning of. I'd get three or four meetings on a good day, but nothing stuck, until the excessively tan man from Mellow Corp shook my hand. You've made a good decision, Cameron had said, pulling me in a bit too close. Employees at Mellow Corp are like a big family. They all stay for life. I wish I'd gotten a chance to clarify what my actual responsibilities were. I just saw a salaried position and a plush darkwood office, and that was good enough for me. It didn't help that Cameron only described the requirements in vague generalities about loyalty and teamwork. Even the liability forms didn't help. Just a flash of an official letterhead, and it was whisked away, leaving me nodding and smiling. Truth is that I didn't have much respect for office jobs. I figured a week laying low and googling things would teach me everything I needed to know. So far, so good. A few days in, and I spent it all coasting around chatting with people. I was given some menial cleaning tasks, and a few organising and career jobs. But mostly, I was just free to watch and learn. It seemed to be a delivery company, although they only shipped one product. No one ever mentioned what the product was, and I didn't want to betray my ignorance by asking. A few dudes in their late thirties said they'd been there for over fifteen years first and last job they'd ever take. The two women working the phones were both ten years plus, and another guy upstairs said he'd been there for over forty. Cameron wasn't joking about the commitment. The funny thing is though, no one seemed the least bit happy or boastful in announcing their sentence. There wasn't any small talk in the break room, no affectionate nicknames, or the inside jokes you'd expect with such long camaraderie. All eyes were sullen, tracing patterns in the uniform carpet. Muffled voices, drudging steps, smiles that gave up before they started. I didn't get it. I casually threw out to one of the guys, why does everyone stay so long if they don't like it here? They don't all, he said not quite meeting my eyes. Last three with your job, killed themselves to get out early. I gave him a big grin, sucking up to show that I appreciated his joke. His deadpan face betrayed nothing. My grin slowly faded as we sat together in silence, him shuffling one foot against the other. Then he left, and I was left standing, Wondering what the hell was going on. I can't imagine myself in this gloomy place for ten years, let alone forty. I resolved to keep applying to jobs, and only work here until I found something better. Besides, I sort of enjoyed the thrill of the hunt, and this place was Snoozeville. I wish it had stayed that way. Few days later, and I was making my first outside delivery blank cardboard package, about the size of a cake. I was bored 
waiting to receive it. Then bored waiting in traffic. I was bored when I rang the doorbell. And bored when she opened the package. And then something started buzzing. And it wasn't boring anymore. Wasps were flooding into the air and they resented their captivity with a vengeance. The sound magnified within seconds until it was all I could hear in every direction. I did what any person would do, scream like a little girl and run as fast as I could without looking back. Only I did look back, about a hundred feet down by my car. When I noticed, the buzzing had stayed there around the woman. She wasn't screaming anymore. Her throat had swollen shut, bulbous swellings covering her face and neck. She still flailed around with her arms and legs, but the movements were getting more sluggish with every vain stroke. The things were crawling through her hair, up her dress, and even into her open mouth. I've seen allergic reactions before. There was a kid in my middle school who ate peanut butter and turned into a balloon animal. But it was nothing like this. I didn't know if the wasps were purposefully stinging the same spots around her face and neck, or if that's all I could see. But the swellings seemed to stack on top of each other. One grotesque swelling, budding off the last. First things first and I vomited. Then I wiped my mouth, got into the car, and made damn sure all the windows were rolled up. By then, my phone was ringing. Now, you really are family. Cameron's voice was a ray of unwelcome sunshine through a dreary morning. You knew what was inside? You knew about the, they're magnificent, aren't they? Put someone sent to the box, starve them a little, and then that's the only one they'll hunt. You're absolutely insane. I know where you work. I'm calling the cops at- Smile for the camera, won't you? He interrupted. Huh? I looked up and down the street, a blinding flash. One of the guys from work was standing outside my window with a camera. He gave me a thumbs up and took another picture. That will go well with the live video, Cameron said. Combine that with the signed confession you have of plotting and executing her murder. I didn't sign. Are you really sure? It didn't matter what I tried to say. It was caught in my throat anyway. You have a break until one. And then two more deliveries in the afternoon. And the phone cut off. Well, I'd love to explain more. But my break is almost over and Cameron is very clear that he doesn't like lateness. Maybe I'll leave early instead, like the others. Their last words, confession of a hospice worker. It takes some by surprise during the night, and I think they're the lucky ones. I think others are holding off for something, their daughter's marriage, their grandchildren, something powerful enough to give the last grains of the hourglass weight. Others simply make up their own mind that it's time. There's one man in particular I remember who hadn't moved a muscle for a day. Several of us at the hospice thought he was already gone a half a dozen times. But then, all at once, he stood up. He carefully put on his suit, tied his tie, fastened his shoes, and laid back down. He was dead within the hour. It's their last words that really stick with me though. Logically, I know they're a random line of conversation slipping from a deteriorating mind, but somehow it also feels like their truest reflection. In that moment when I'm holding her frail hand, I know her better than her husband and her children ever did. People can hide their whole life long, but they can't keep hiding into death. That's how I feel, anyway. And that's why I started keeping a journal of all the last words I hear. I don't know where to go next. That one hit me hard. She was 94 years old, 
hardly bigger than Yoda. She usually just watched me in silence when I cleaned her room. It was late, and I was tired, and I didn't know how to comfort her. I just pretended that I didn't hear. She was gone when I got in the next morning. Am I in the way? Seems silly, doesn't it? Inconsequential. But the man was a World War II veteran. He told me once about how he and a dozen men broke over a thousand people out of the camps. He wanted to go home at the end, but I saw his two sons fighting over who would take him in the lobby. Neither did. He died in the hospice, his last words being, am I in the way? Not going without a fight. I liked that one, barrel-chested man, looking as healthy as could be. The fight was a seizure though, and one of the worst. I had ever seen. It must have lasted half an hour, bucking and flowing and gasping for breath. I think he would have done better just going quietly. Dead, 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 over and over. Ever since the woman's stroke, she convinced me that she had already died. She never stopped muttering to herself, dead, 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 being one of her favorite mantras. Sometimes I wonder if thoughts can linger in the air after their thinker has died. I can swear the rooms are darker for at least a week after someone goes. If it's a violent death, I'll feel tension in the air. Something like anger without a body attached to it. I decided to start keeping track. My hobby of journaling became a bit more of an obsession, if I'm being honest. I took a calendar and marked down how I felt about the rooms each day. I didn't fill in the deaths until the end of the month, and sure enough, each death marked the change in a room. Now I know this isn't an exact science, but in the process I did notice something that I couldn't explain. For the last four deaths in my building, their last utterances began with the following words, I am not dead. Isn't it silly, right? Here were four unrelated people who never talked to each other and their last words formed a sentence. It was a silly coincidence. It meant nothing. But it kept getting stranger. Can you get me a little water? 11B said a few days later. You look like an angel, said 23A. A heart attack during the night. Hear the birds outside? I do love the spring sitting by her window, the sun on her face. It should have been the most peaceful one for me, but the moment she closed her eyes, I knew the word fit. I am not dead. Can you hear? Can I hear what? I found out this morning. I wasn't there when he said it, but everybody at the hospice knew I was keeping track. My friend told me the moment I walked in the door. Me and my buddies are going to see each other real soon. I am not dead. Can you hear me? The rooms all seem dark today. Sergeant Dawson's widow deserves to know how he really died. By Tobias Wade. Dear Mrs. Dawson, my name is Frank Tiller, and I was with your husband when he died. I don't know how to contact you proper, but the sergeant once told me the two of you used to read stories like this, so I figured you might find these words too. He used to read to you while you drew pictures from what was happening. Isn't that right? He said you weren't scared of anything no matter how dark it got. Your laughter was a light to follow. I don't suppose you're laughing much these days. I know I'm not. Two gunshots, one in the chest, one in the stomach. He didn't abandon his position, not as long as he could provide cover to give the rest of us a chance away from the ambush. That's what they told you, wasn't it? I was shocked when I read the report, but I suppose I understand why they lied. That's a hero's death they gave him. They knew you wouldn't question it, and really, that's all they cared about. 
Pardon if I'm overstepping my boundaries, ma'am. But if I were you, I'd want to know the truth, even if it wasn't so pretty. The report said he died May 22nd, but you have to understand that this began on the 13th, when our squad encountered a landmine. I detonated beneath the front left fire of our LTATV jeep, with a sound so loud I only felt it. I was thrown clear when the jeep went into the air, but Sergeant Dawson got the worst of it in the driver's seat. What metal hadn't disintegrated had melted and run like candle wax, leaving a crater in the car like a meteor had just punched through it. Nobody could have told you how your husband walked away from that, with hardly a limp, just like nobody could say he was the same afterwards. Doctors said it was an acute case of PTSD, but I see what PTSD looks like every time I look in the mirror, and it didn't feel nothing like that to me. I don't know how to write describe it, Mom, but when the sergeant talked, it felt like he was calling from the bottom of the deepest wells, like he wasn't there at all. Just a little echo that started a long time ago. Sometimes, he'd look right at me and say something like, Frankie, what have you got waiting for you back home? And we'd talk, like a bunch of geezers on a park bench with all the time in the world. He was like that when the captain came in, sober enough to be approved for his position again. Captain wouldn't have been so quick if he saw him at his dark times. He'd forget who I was, or who he was, wandering lost and scared until I found him and brought him back to his quarters. Other times he'd start screaming at a wall, really going at it, red-faced, with the veins bulging in his neck, and spit, flying like a drill sergeant. Every day, it seemed the dark side was a little more the only side. Even when he had it together, he'd forget my name, or say something which betrayed how fragile his mind was. Once, real loud in front of everyone in the barracks, he ordered me, to climb to the moon on the finest of ladders. His voice, sing song like a loon. The captain didn't see it, but the rest of the men did. I heard them making fun of the sergeant behind his back, taunting him for his wild, intellectual and personality fluctuations. Your husband only made it worse, ordering a man to grow a beard or demand to know why the King of England was so late in arriving. He was a laughing stock behind closed doors, and sometimes the doors weren't even closed. Other men gave me shit for not joining in, but on my word, I wouldn't do that. If the sergeant asked me to jump, I'd ask how high. And if he said it was to the moon, then I'd give it my damn best. Count all the bricks in the barracks, it was 16,444, and I didn't leave until after midnight. You see, I knew your husband was still there, somewhere nobody could reach him anymore. He was the same man who had saved my life on more than one occasion, and I would follow him to whatever end. I thought that he noticed I was listening, really listening. Then he'd find his way back if he knew he wasn't being judged or looked down on, or forgotten, he'd have a real reason to return. God, Mom, those days scared the hell out of me. I wasn't just scared for the sergeant, who seemed to be kept getting worse. I was scared for myself. The only way I used to sleep at night is trusting the sergeant was going to keep me safe. And these days, even pills couldn't settle me down. I didn't give up on him. I want you to know that. Every damn possible thing he'd say, I look him in the eyes and say, Yes, sir. Everything except one. The night of May 22nd, the night he grabbed me by the shoulders and looked me in the eye, 
The night he really knew me. When he asked for me to take his life. I feel something bad, Frankie, he said. Like my soul needs to take a really bad shit that's been brewing way too long. I told him not to worry about it. We all feel like that sometimes, and he chuckled a bit, but he wouldn't lay off. I want you to put a bullet in me, two to be sure. Something's coming, Frankie, and I don't want to be around when it gets here. The next question out of his mouth was how much would it cost me to buy India? I told him I needed time to research it, and he let me go for the night. He had no right to ask me a question like that. Not the India one, the other one. I didn't deserve to be put in the position where I had just walked away in shame. Maybe the rest of the men were right, I thought. I ought to have just called a medical officer and gotten him locked up a long time ago. For his own safety, and everyone else. I just couldn't bring myself to admit he was already gone. That's why I'm taking responsibility for what happened, Mom. And it's why I'm writing this letter to you now. The sergeant wasn't wearing nothing but skin when the midnight shift caught him sneaking around the base. I know for a fact that neither of them fired a shot before they were dead. And the alarm didn't go yet. There are a lot of different accounts after that, Mom. Some say he had fur growing down his sides and a mouth like the inside of a butcher's shop. Others think he was high on amphetamines or something. So much that he didn't feel pain, nor even remorse for the men that he butchered. All I can tell you with certainty is what I saw with my own two eyes. That was the sergeant burying his head in a man's chest cavity, like a starved dog. And when everything was over, seven body bags were stacked against the far fence. His being one of them. One in the head, one in the chest. Two to make sure. I guess on that count the army told the truth. Just what the sergeant ordered. But I was a damn fool for not listening to him sooner. And there's six fine ladies who are going to have a man in uniform knock on their door, holding a flag. Just like how it happened to you. What they didn't tell you though, what they didn't want to tell anyone, but I damn near forced it out of them, was that the sergeant was cold long before I shot him down. Eight to ten days, that was their best guess. Putting the actual death closer to the 11th. Nobody knows how your husband walked away from that. And it's my theory that he never did. Hair twined between fingers, dirt bloodied into paste, coiled muscle, panting breath, and a broken smile. What are you? I shouted down at him. I'm me. I hit him again. Hard enough for the bones in my hand to rattle against each other. I don't know why it made me so angry that he was still smiling. I want to hear you say it. What are you? Too much. I don't want it. I don't want... I don't. Again, the pain in my hand was triumph. The kid would have been flat on the ground if I wasn't still holding him up by his hair. Just say it. That's all you gotta do. Admit what you are. I'm happy. I dropped Chase to crumple in a heap. The boy was laughing, blood spraying from his mouth as he did. Exhausted, I sat down next to him. He rolled back and forth, body rigidly locked up in a fetal position. He was taking great gasps of air and choking on his own blood, laughing all the while. God damn it, you're literally insane, I panted. Chase choked again. The coughing didn't stop this time. I helped him onto his knees and slapped his back to clear the airway. He rewarded me with a giant bloody smile. I would have stopped if you just said it, I said, my voice calmer. Why are you so stubborn? You want me to say I'm autism, he slurred. He was hard enough to understand without a mouthful of blood. Autistic, I corrected. I want you to tell the truth and stop pretending you're normal. I never pretended. I never normal. Pretended normal. 
His breath was coming easier now. I couldn't look away from the long line of vicious blood which hung from his lip without quite falling. Not many people are happy. I'm special like that. We both laughed, although I don't think we were laughing at the same thing. For the first few weeks, I knew Chase. I hated his guts. All the special attention he got. Everyone doing stuff for him and congratulating him for accomplishing absolutely nothing. For that big dopey grin he didn't deserve. I thought it was just all a big act. I hated that he wore clothes like a normal person and sat in class without doing any of the work. I thought I could beat the truth out of him. And I guess I did. The truth was that he was really happy. Maybe the only truly happy person I'd ever known. I know I'm autism, he told me later in his customary lurching speech. I know what it means. I'm autism. I don't play around. Play pretend. Then why don't you ever say it? I do. I just say it last. If I say it first, people don't listen to the rest. They think they already know me. I stayed quiet while we walked home. He was rolling his sleeves up and down his right forearm, up and down, then both down, then both up. He never stuck with one tick very long. The next moment, he was on his tiptoes, tottering along behind me. Then, he was loudly humming some made-up tune, or flapping his arms like a bird, or spitting straight up in the air and shrieking with laughter as he tried to dodge the falling drop. Whatever he was doing seemed to absorb him completely. So much that when I spoke again, he jumped in surprise to find me still there. You're too busy busy, he said even though he was the one doing everything while I just walked. That's why it's why you're not happy. I'm not even doing anything, I declared. Too many things, he insisted, always shouting it. I looked around to make sure no one else was around. Not nothing, you're looking at ten things, thinking about twenty, thirty, forty, fifty things, not real things, old things, new things, could be things and shouldn't be things. So what? You're the one always spazzing out, his whole face furrowed in confusion. Then he smiled. I just do one thing with my whole heart. I was getting frustrated. That's not true. In the five minutes we've been walking, you've done like a hundred different things. He shook his head, his grin widening. Just one thing, all my heart. Just one thing. Then when I'm finished, I do another. And that really makes you happy. It doesn't bother you that you're different. He didn't answer though. He stopped to pet a bushy plant as if it were a dog. I'm not waiting for you. I'm going home. The plants can't walk, he interrupted. I'm not talking about the plants. Or drive cars. Or make friends, he rambled. Despite myself, I stopped and waited to hear where this was going. They're different too. And some have flowers. And some have spikes. And some have flowers. You already said flowers, I interrupted. Because some have lots, Chase declared, unperturbed. It would be stupid if they didn't grow, though, just because they were different. Everything grows is different. Everything dies. Everything dies. He grasped the bushy plant he'd been petting with both hands and ripped it violently by the roots. A moment later and everything was in the air, stems and leaves and clods of soil all raining around us while he laughed and danced through it. You're retarded, I said. Chase grinned. So are you. But it's okay, we're still growing. He wasn't so talkative the next day in school. He had a fresh bruise on her one eye. I know that shouldn't have made me so angry after what I'd done to him, but it did. I asked what happened, but it didn't feel like talking. Tell me who did it, I demanded. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. He shook his head, not looking at me. I tried to grab him by the shoulder and turn him my way to get a better look but he yelped and darted into the corner of the room. He pulled out a notebook from his bag and began writing furiously, not looking up as I crept closer. If someone was hurting him, then I wanted to know. I liked the idea of getting into a fight with someone like it was my penance for what I've already done. I snuck a peek at what he was writing. Chase was halfway through the notebook and I figured it was some kind of journal or something. I got too close again though and Chase started shrieking the teacher assumed I was picking on him and gave me detention on the spot. It was so stupid. When I was actually hurting him, we just became friends. But now, I was trying to help him, and I got in trouble. I shouted at Chase, 
telling him to explain that I was on his side. Chase didn't look up though. The only result was the teacher grabbing me by the arm to march me all the way to the principal's office. Boys will be boys, I heard the principal say through the door. I waited outside on a hard plastic chair for him to finish his meeting. Chase is being tormented. You don't understand how hard it is to take care of a- Came a man's voice. I stopped kicking the wall to listen. Perhaps a public school is not the safest environment for- It's your job to make it safe, if anything happens to him. Mr. Hackent, please, the teachers will always do their best, but they can't be everywhere at once, what happens before or after school. I opened the door. Sudden silence. The principal in a sweater vest and the man I can only assume to be Chase's father in a suit, both staring at me. I can keep an eye on him to and from school, I said. The principal looked uncomfortable. He was well aware of my history of fighting to placate the angry man sitting across from him, though. So we nodded after a moment. That's settled then, he said. The teachers will keep Chase safe during school. And now he'll be safe on the way too. Mr. Hackett growled at me, his eyes narrowed in suspicion. What about at home? I asked, staring straight back. What happens at home is none of your business, he replied, standing up rigidly. If anything happens now, at least, I'll know who to blame. The bruises didn't go away, though. There was a fresh one at least once a week. Chase didn't want to talk about it, but at least he was talking about other stuff again. Everything except what he wrote in his journal. One thing, your whole heart, one thing at a time, he said. If you let that one thing be something bad, then that bad thing is all there is. Just ignoring something doesn't make it go away. If someone still is hurting you, I stopped because he wasn't listening anyway. He was just playing with his ears, not looking at me, folding them back and forth, back and forth. I don't ignore it, he said after a long moment. Huh? I just don't take it with me, he insisted. I write it down, then I leave it behind. Fists only hurt once. It's not too bad, and then it's over. Thinking about it hurts more, hurts longer. Most things are like that. It's the thinking about the thing that hurts more than the thing. So, just stop thinking about it. Are you happy now? I asked him. Always happy, he said. Although, he didn't smile that time. I just got to focus on growing. He didn't look at me very often, but he did this time, right in my eyes, still staring while he hid his journal behind an electric box. He put a finger to his lips, hissing a loud, shh, before turning to walk away. He could have hidden it anywhere but he was doing it right in front of me because he trusted me. I entertained the thought of just taking it and trying to find out the truth, but now it seemed more important to prove that I was his friend. I hate how much sense he made at the time. I hate how easily I let it go. I started seeing Mr. Hackent at the school more frequently. There'd always be shouting as soon as the principal's door closed, and I wasn't the only one who noticed Pretty soon kids started talking, and someone must have spoken about seeing me beat up Chase that one time. After that, I was forbidden to walk with Chase, or even talk to him in the hallway. The bruises didn't stop, though. They weren't happening at school, and they weren't happening on the way there, either. I kept getting called into the principal's office. I tried to explain it must have been happening at home, but no one believed me. I started getting really angry at Chase, because I wanted him to tell people the truth, but he couldn't handle the pressure. The tensions turned into suspension, with threats of permanent expulsion if Chase didn't stop getting abused. It wasn't my fight, that's what I told myself. The little idiot was going to be happy no matter what happened, and the only thing I was doing by getting involved was making things worse for myself. So I let it go. I stayed the hell away from him, didn't speak to him didn't even look at him. Even when he tried to talk to me, I just walked away. I thought no one could blame me if they saw that I wanted nothing to do with him. Though it didn't stop from me blaming myself. The lights and sirens were on my block a few days after I cut contact. I was taken down to the police station for questioning. There was so much going on, I couldn't even process it. I just remember rolling my sleeves up and down up and down, 
trying not to think, up and down, with all my heart, because the moment I stopped, I know I'd heard everyone talking about the autistic boy. That's what they called him on the news, not even using his name. The autistic boy who took his own life with a razor blade. I'd hear about the insistent bullying which drove him to it, and hear his father blathering about doing all he could. But I know Chase would never do that. He was happy, he was growing, and nothing could have stopped that except someone pulling him up by the roots. The first thing I did was retrieve Chase's journal. There was a hundred things I could have done with it to prove what really happened. But I only picked one, one thing at a time, one thing with all your heart. And for me, that was revenge. Mr. Hackett is a dead man. It took me a few days snooping around his house to find a reliable way in, the broken grate which let me slip into his basement from the outside. I'd wait until I saw him leave for work in the morning, then I'd sneak upstairs to his bedroom. Over the next week, he'd find quotes from Chase's journal, cut out and left around the house. He doesn't like hurting me, he just can't help it, on his bedside table. Dad wishes I was normal, I wish he wasn't, taped onto his bathroom mirror. He wanted me to go, but I have nowhere else to go, on his leftover eggs in the refrigerator, ketchup soaking through the paper like blood. It was working too. Every day he left for work, he looked a little more tired, a little more on edge. On Thursday, he skipped work entirely, and when he left Friday morning, it looked like he'd been wearing the same clothes since Wednesday. When he got home that night, this is what he found. Are you happy now? It was spray paint this time. On every wall. Every counter. On the ceiling and across his bed sheets. Are you happy now? I heard him shouting when he found out, screaming at the top of his lungs. The sound distorting as he ran from room to room, seeing it everywhere. Are you happy now? Neighbors reported a gunshot that same night. Rumor had it that he had spent several hours ranting about ghosts to his family before it happened. The police concluded that he'd been driven to madness over the death of his son, which I guess isn't too far from the truth. One thing at a time, and now that I've finished what I set out to do, I've got to keep myself busy, really busy, insistently jumping from one project to the next. I need to always be living, always growing, because I know when it gets too quiet, I'll have to stop and think. And I'm afraid of the moments when I have to think to myself, am I happy now? Self-Portrait from the Dead by Tobias Wade Grandfather Jack's name might as well have been a swear word when I was growing up. Dad told me the story once, on the condition that I never tell my mother that I knew. Jack was married to my grandmother Kathy for 22 years, before he cheated on her. It wasn't a midlife crisis, or an intoxicated indiscretion either. He'd be going on fishing trips, every other weekend for almost a year, before Kathy figured out the fish was named Sally and she was half his age. Either Dad didn't know the specifics, or he wouldn't tell me. But I guess Kathy decided suicide was a less sinful way out than murder or divorce. That was before I was even born. But Mum hasn't spoken a word to her father since. I still got to know him, though. It took eight years of begging and pleading after I was born. But Mum finally gave in and arranged for us to meet, using my father to deliver messages between them, as she was afraid of what she'd say if they spoke. I was pretty scared when Dad told me we were going to drive an hour into the desert to visit Grandpa Jack's house, and Mom only made it worse in the days leading up to the meeting. He might be an axe murderer by now for all I know, Mom said. Dad said he's a professor of art history. 
or maybe he'll say nasty things about me. Whatever he tells you, I don't want you to listen to him. Dad made a joke about how I've already had a lot of practice not listening to my parents, and Mum didn't smile. In fact, it would be better if you just didn't talk to him at all. Just let him see that you're a happy, healthy, well-adjusted boy, and then go play by yourself until Dad takes you home, okay? You're gonna have a great time, Dad told me on the way. He's got a whole art studio set up with everything you can imagine. Clay pots and sculptures, water and oil paints, brushes and tools of every size and shape. We can hang out all day if you want. Does Grandfather hate me? I asked. Of course not. He wouldn't have kept sending letters all those years if he hated you. He cares about seeing his grandson. Does he hate Mama? Your mum is a saint. No one could hate her. Did he hate Grandma? My dad looked uncomfortable at that. You'll have to ask him yourself. So I did. That was the first thing out of my mouth. Grandpa Jack was a pudgy old man. Straight bald, with discoloured blotches on his scalp, and a huge moustache that wiggled when he talked. He came rushing at me, arms wide for a hug, and I asked him if he hated my grandmother. It froze him in his tracks. Dad stepped in front of me, as if to protect me from being hit. But Grandfather Jack just squatted down to my height, and looked me solemnly in the eye. I never loved any woman half as much as I did Kathy, except your mother, of course. Just because two people love each other doesn't mean they make each other happy, though. I guess I just wasn't strong enough to spend any more of my life being unhappy, and not brave enough to hurt your grandmother by telling her the truth. He smelled like Old Spice, and that seemed like a pretty satisfactory explanation at eight. I let him show me his studio, and we painted a big landscape together. He did all the hard stuff and details, and helped me transform every messy blotch I made into something beautiful, without painting over my contribution. He asked if I was going to go visit again, and I said I wanted to, as long as my mother would allow it. I've never seen a man go so red so fast. His moustache bristling like a porcupine. Your mother's got no right to tell you anything. She can throw fits and slam doors all she wants, but you're my family, and you're the only thing left in this world I give a damn about. You tell her that, okay? I didn't get to visit as often as I would have liked, but at least every month or two, Dad would drive me out there. Mum was reluctant at first, but I convinced her that I wanted to be a painter, and that she'd be crushing my budding dreams if Jack didn't teach me how. I loved the landscapes, but Jack's speciality was portraits, and his passion for them soon rubbed off on me. A good portrait only depicts the subject, he told me. It'll get the scruff on his chin and the wrinkles under his eyes, and everything else that makes him who he is but a great portrait. Here, he took a long drink from his iced tea, liking to draw my attention out as long as it could go. A great portrait is always a portrait of the artist. It doesn't matter who he's deciding to paint. He puts so much of himself into that, it's going to tell you more about him than the person he's painting. Jack had a special gallery just for self-portraits. He did a new one every year. The passage of time immaculately mapped onto his many faces. Seeing all the paintings together like that, I could not help but notice that every year his brow seemed a little heavier, his smile was a little sadder, and his eyes a little more weary. I didn't like seeing him change like that, and I told him so. Don't you worry. I still know how to paint a happy picture. I'm just saving it for the year when your mother finally forgives me. I told Mum that too. She told me that he'd be better off figuring out how to decorate hell. 
Their self-portraits made me sad. But they didn't start to frighten me until Grandfather showed me his latest work when I was 19 years old. Where are your eyes? I asked, staring at the black pools of flesh dominating his latest portrait. The lines were more jagged than his previous work, making his sagged face seemed to be carved from marble. Right behind my glasses, silly, he said. Why didn't you paint them? He studied the picture, seeming to notice for the first time. Would you look at that? Doesn't matter. You can tell it's still me, can't you? His figures were missing in the portrait next year. The whole face seemed to be sliding, almost as if skin was a liquid that was dripping right off. He couldn't figure out why I was making such a fuss over it. Looks like me to me, he grunted. Shortly after, Jack was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and it was all downhill from there. He retired as a professor several years back, and painting wasn't a hobby anymore. It was an obsession. Now that I was living on my own, it was easier to visit him more often. But even in the span of a week, he'd have finished three or four self-portraits, each more disconcerting than the last. I don't know why he even called them self-portraits. They weren't even recognisable as human anymore. Just tormented flesh, grotesquely and unevenly contoured, as though the underlying skeleton was replaced with a haphazard pile of trash. He'd get angry if I didn't recognise him in his pictures. He said he was painting who he was, and that, if I didn't see that, then I was the one who was blind. A few days later, and he'd be excited to show me his next one, completely forgetting that the last one even existed at all. When is your mum going to come see me? I've been calling her all week. He even forgot that she hates him too. Every time he'd ask, and every time I'd make a vague excuse, and promised that she'd be there next time. He was 86 when he had his stroke. He didn't paint again after that, and within the year, he was gone. Dad and I went to the funeral, but Mum just locked herself in her room. Grandfather still left everything to her anyhow, saying in the will that I may not be able to give her a home, but at least I can give her my house. She didn't want to even set foot in the place, though. So a week or so later, I went to start boxing up the stuff for her. That's when I saw his final painting. I was dreading even going into his studio. And not just because I knew it was going to be the biggest of jobs. I started stacking the abominable canvases face down, so I wouldn't have to look at them. But I couldn't help but notice that this one was different. It was so perfect that it could have been a photograph. The self-portrait showed Jack lying peacefully in his casket, hands crossed over his chest, eyes still closed. It was strange that he'd been able to paint it so precisely, though, considering the rest of his recent work littering the room. I sat there for a while, thinking how heartbreaking it was for him to predict his own death like that. I left the painting out while packing, thinking of hanging it in my apartment to honour him. There were plenty of less morbid pictures to choose from, but this one felt like it really was him who painted it, not the disease which had ravaged his mind. It made me think that his spirit was at rest somewhere, and that made me glad. I hung it in my bedroom that night, saying goodbye to him, just as I had done on dozens of sleepovers, where I'd lay in my sleeping bag at the foot of his bed. I fell asleep quickly, exhausted from the manual work that day. I slept straight through the night, not even dreaming as far as I can remember, then sitting up in the morning. The first thing I saw was Jack staring back at me from his portrait, the one that had shown closed eyes last night. 
Maybe it was like that yesterday, but I didn't notice it. But that wasn't sitting right with me at all. I remember how Jack always used to get angry when I didn't see the same thing as him in his pictures. Maybe he was right. And I really was just blind. I didn't think too much into it, until the next night when I woke up, and the painting was screaming. No sound, but the mouth was just open, twisted and frozen, in unending agony. I just sat in bed, breathing hard, staring at the colourless torment and the weak light from my window. I kept lying back down, and trying to convince myself it was a dream, unable to sit still for more than a few seconds before jolting upright again to stare at the painting. It took me almost half an hour to finally get out of bed and turn the light back on. I laughed out loud to see him sleeping peacefully in the casket with his eyes closed, but I still slept with the light on for the rest of the night. In the morning, his eyes were unmistakably open once more. I didn't blame Jack's painting. I blamed myself for being blind like he'd always scolded me about. I called my mother and told her about my weird dream on her voicemail. Grandpa Jack is in pain, I told her. I would have said more, but I felt stupid and hung up shortly after. I didn't actually hear the screaming until the second night, and by then, it was already too late. Sometimes in the early morning, I was out of bed and halfway across the room before I was even fully awake. The sound ripped me from my bed so fast that I didn't even realise it was coming from the painting. There was enough light to see Grandfather's features, twisted in agony. My downstairs neighbour started pounding on the roof, and that only seemed to make the screaming louder. The thrum of blood in my ears matched the beat, then raced past. I tried to run, but my door handle wouldn't turn. I didn't struggle long. To stand by the door, I had to be right next to the portrait, and the sound was excruciating. I pulled the portrait from the wall. Hanging beneath it was a second portrait, one I'd never put there, one of the disfigured ones with its lumps of flesh all supported wrong from underneath. I saw this as a sign, although I was too freaked out to guess at what, so I hung the screaming painting back to cover the abomination. I re-secured the wall and started to retreat towards the window. I never made it more than a step before a firm grip grasped my wrist and pulled me back. One of my grandfather's hands no longer ended at the canvas. Cold, pale skin, its nails dragging into me, relentlessly dragging me back towards the picture, as though through an open window. Now I was screaming too. Someone started hammering on my door and I tried to brace myself against the wall with my feet. The pale hands shook for its effort, but I was still stronger, inch by inch, pulling me into his coffin. I almost wriggled free when his second hand shot out, this one catching me by the throat, to haul me forwards at an alarming rate. I was so close I could smell him, not the old spice cologne he always wore. My face pressed against the canvas. It smelt like rotten meat. Then I was through. I clenched my eyes shut, helpless as his cold arms wrapped around me. It was quiet on the other side. I couldn't even hear my heart anymore. The pressure around me was gentle, like being encompassed by cool water or even a heavy fog. A moment later, and the sensation was already retracting. I opened my eyes and found myself standing in my bedroom, facing the portrait on the wall, hands folded across his lap, eyes closed just like it ought to be. I spent the next half hour profusely apologising to my neighbours. I'm lucky I didn't get locked up. After that, I called my mum, surprised to find her in tears. Are you okay? Where are you? I asked. I'm okay. Dad's okay. 
I visited him in the cemetery this morning. It's stupid of me, right? She paused to sniffle and blew her nose. Do you think he knows? I told her. I think he was pretty pleased about that. And that made me happy too. I don't know what would have happened to me if she hadn't. The rules of being cliché. The first rule of being cliché is living a cliché-filled type of life. Life is so full of clichés, don't you think? And especially with the type of stories and entertainment we get forced to watch and listen to. This story is also going to be one of those cliché type of stories where the obvious casual link ends with an obvious result. I mean, have you ever watched something so cliché and predictable that it made you look like some sort of psychic? <laughs> I mean, I have. I want to first talk about a creature or some higher being called the Cliché Man. The Cliché Man always feeds off clichés, really, which I am sure most of you could have guessed right away, and I am sure you have also realized that the Cliché Man gets stronger when in a clichéd environment. I had a pretty normal life with a wife and two children, and while I was the main breadwinner of the household, my wife took care of the kids and the house. Life was pretty good in the normal good family sense of the world and I had also managed to take my family out on holidays, family days, out to restaurants, and so on. So we were a pretty cliched family to start off with, which attracted the cliché man in the first place, which I am sure a lot of you could have predicted easily. The second rule of being cliché is weird things suddenly happening without much reason. In the first couple of weeks leading up to the cliché man invading my life, I started getting so many so-called psychics following me around everywhere and telling me my future and the future of my family. It was things like, my wife will start having an affair and I must follow the rules of being cliché and I would have to murder my wife and her lover. I thought they were crazy, but one day while I was on my break in the office, I got a phone call of my wife saying that she had an affair with another man in our own bedroom. I honestly didn't know what to think or feel about any of it, but my wife then said, you have got to follow the rules of being cliché and murder me and my lover. The third rule of being cliché is my marriage and what I have always known and loved going bad. Then, I came home to find that my wife and her lover were in our bed prepared to be killed by me. I wasn't even really angry or furious or anything, just highly confused and very freaked out. There was a knife outside our bedroom door and I saw both my wife and her lover just smiling at me waiting to be killed by me because that's what usually happens when a husband finds his wife with another man in their own bedroom look you two i don't know what the rules of being cliche are but i'm going back to work i told my wife and her lover and both of them looked so disappointed and angry with me for disobeying the rules of being cliche made by the cliche man daddy you must follow the rules of being cliche because if you don't then the cliche man will be angry my two sons told me, and I didn't notice before that they were both behind me. Fourth rule of being cliché is some weird paranormal ability being performed on you to force you to do something against your will. Because out of nowhere, my mind swapped with my wife's mind and I was in her body and she was in mine. My wife then threatened me while in my body that if I don't follow the rules of being cliché, then she will take over my body forever after killing her body with my mind inside it. I desperately decided that I will murder her and her lover if my mind could go back into my body, and it did. Obviously, I am sure a lot of you guessed by now that my family's mind has been taken over by the cliché man. How predictable, right? As I was back in my own body, I ran over to my wife and stabbed her to death, and then I murdered her lover. My two sons ran over to me and hugged me and shouting in joy, Well done, father. The cliché man will be so pleased you follow the rules of being cliché and predictable. The fifth rule of being cliché is having your close one affected by a tragic event. 
The ages of my sons are 13 and 15, and the obvious next phase of my two sons seeing me murder their mother is they go crazy and start acting out. I put the bodies of my wife and her lover down in the cellar, where we keep a larger freezer, which could fit both their bodies. That year, my two sons started behaving badly and getting into trouble, and whenever I question them about it, my son's reply will be, It's just the rules of being cliché. Youngsters like us who have witnessed something terrible go crazy and start acting out because we have something bottled up, my sons would tell me. Then, I heard my wife calling me from downstairs into the cellar from the freezer. Stan, you should understand the rules of being cliché by now. My dead wife's body would shout out from the cellar freezer and I would shake in fear. Yes, honey, I shakily replied. The sixth rule of being cliché is always having something outside, hearing something, seeing something, and knowing something. Now, in these sort of situations, there is always predictably some sort of friend, colleague, or family member who notices something strange, or saw something, and heard something. That's exactly what happened when my next door neighbors came over to meet me. Without any friendliness or anything to break the ice, they instantly start talking about the roles of being cliché and what their role is going to be. They were the ones to go to the police to report to them about me and the disappearance of my wife. Then, this is where I eventually get arrested and my two sons go into care and get mental health treatment. I was against everything and didn't want to be a part of this cliché or follow any stupid rules belonging to cliché. The seventh rule of being cliché is eventually being stuck in some horrible situation which you cannot escape and cannot break out of. Then my mind swapped with my dead wife's body and it was so cold and empty, I couldn't even shiver, cry, or shout for help. I could hear my wife in my body and enjoying herself being warm and being able to move around again. She came down while inside my body and she basically said to me, The cliché man will let you back in your body if you promise to follow the rules of being cliché. And I desperately and cowardly agreed, and how cliché of me that is. I am back in my body and my next door neighbors have gone to the police, and I have hugged and kissed my boys goodbye forever. I'm so sorry if the story has been so cliché and predictable. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. If you did enjoy the video, please remember to hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon to be notified every time I post. You can also leave a comment with your thoughts, as well as a very helpful like, as it goes a long way. Remember that if you have a story you wish to share, all that you need to do is send it to my email, and I'll be sure to read it. But for now, I have a few words from my good friend Frictional Weekly, whose channel you should definitely go check out after this. This is Frictional Weekly. I want to thank Mortis Media for allowing me to collab with the channel. It really helps a smaller channel like me grow faster. My daily routine is listening to horror narrations like Mortis Media, so it's always fun to be part of one myself. My channel is dedicated mainly to creating factual videos on horror games, not horror narrations, though I will occasionally do horror narrations on my podcasts, or me and my friends might talk about our own scary stories. So I make lore videos, countdowns, podcasts, and host live streams on survival horror games. If you're interested, check it out yourself in the description. And if this sounds interesting to you, consider subscribing.